it's very interesting how psychologically we start to provide a justification for our own underperformance and we normalize it. Hello and welcome back, Architect Nation. I'm Enix Sears, and this is the show where you'll discover tips, strategies, and secrets for running an architectural practice that lets you do your best work more often. If you haven't already, headed over to smartpracticemethod.com to check out our free 60-minute Firmoner Masterclass. What are you waiting for? You'll get free access to over a decade of experience, research, and tons of hard work, sweat, and energy into discovering what it takes to run a successful small practice that supports your life. So today we're going to have a, an amazing topic. I'm joined by my co-host here, Ryan Willard, who's the host of the Business of Architecture podcast and actually the host of this podcast as well. Plus, for those of you who don't know, Ryan Willard is the is the right-hand man here at uh, Business of Architecture, practically a co-founder, came on board the business early in our consultancy. We've been working together. Ryan has been leading up uh, the programs that we offer here at Business of Architecture, the training, the coaching. He is a high-performance mentor in his own right, uh, and so super happy to have him here on the show because of the many varied practices that he gets to rub shoulders with in the Business of Architecture programs. And now a message from our sponsor, RCAT. There's no doubt that building information modeling has changed the industry. And I'd like to tell you about a cool resource for you as you're looking to get the best product information for your projects. This is what RCAT delivers. RCAT is an online catalog that offers data-rich objects, families, systems for free without registration. And to sweeten the deal, you can download these files in the last four editions of Revit in SketchUp format or DWG format. It's all very clean. They're kept up to date. A fantastic resource for you as you're trying to figure out what you want to specify and making sure you have the best and up-to-date product information. Go to rcat.com today and uh, check it out. That's A-R-C-A-T dot C-O-M. Ryan, welcome and good evening. Thank you very much for such a generous introduction. Well, you're welcome. So Ryan, today with that, now that I got you feeling good, let's jump into the conversation. <laughs> so today we're going to talk about, we're going to talk about the, the 200 Club. What is we are. the 200 Club? Is it is it a, a, a secret society in the uh in the underworld of manhattan you have to know someone to get in is this is, is a swanky a swanky penthouse in in london in the financial district the 200 club the is 200 an shall, shall we hold them shall we hold them along yeah well it, it's an exclusive club and it's a very it's, okay. special it's it very is. special club that we want to see more people joining Absolutely. the 200 club Right so around gonna, the right around the world, in, indeed. So, here you are. You may be wondering what's the two hundred club. Well, let's set the stage first, and we're gonna obviously this relates to you running a small architectural practice, and let's first set up some of the problems that we're gonna be addressing on today's podcast episode. Problems that you likely are dealing with as a small firm owner. So, problem number one is that when you look at how your practice is doing you're very much in the dark with, or it can feel like you're in the dark with how your firm is performing compared to other practices, other practices of similar size. You may feel, for instance, that your operations are inefficient. You may feel that something may be amiss. You're kind of maybe even confused a little bit, wondering what are the things that you don't know that you don't know. So this can be perplexing and certainly feel lonely as a firm owner. Ryan, what other problems are from owners up against? I, I think there's no real comparators for high performance. So a lot of high, a lot of when we jump on sales calls or we start interacting with clients, sometimes they'll say, well, what what is good? What is good? Like, how do I know what is p performing? So sometimes we have these AIA reports or the REBA reports. Um, but I don't think whilst they're good at giving us an idea of what other architects are charging, for example, like these kind of fee surveys or the fee surveys that we've done here, um, they no, they don't offer any real comparators for high performance. There's no grading. There's no like, this is, this is excellent because we're often looking at data from an underperforming industry. So we look at a lot of these we look at these benchmarks. I mean, I, when, when I look at the Reba ones, for example, and you see the numbers of like the average architecture firm, I mean, just 
even doing better than what the average is is not good. <laughs> exactly. Because exactly. it's so low. Well, indeed. I mean, we just look at like the AI produces, a, I believe it's every other year, don't quote me on that, but the AI produces a, a very, very well-documented compensation report uh, that's, that's mm-hmm. very useful for practitioners to look to see by area how much people are paying team members, how much people are paying staff members. And it's interesting if you look at the numbers that that small firm practitioners earn. So firm owners themselves, whether they're solo or they have a small team around them, you can look it up and you can see based upon their sample size, you can see how much a firm owner of a small practice might be earning. And historically it's been around, you know, it's gone up a little bit in the past few years, but we're talking $80,000 year, $80, or so US dollars. And when you compare that to other professions, other businesses, other things that people could be doing, I mean, a very successful fast food chain here is called In-N-Out Burger. You've probably heard of it. They're they're famous for their their simply prepared hamburgers, their simple meal, and they're, they always have a line through the drive-thru. Uh, I have a friend who's a manager of that store, and he earns $120,000 a year. So he's a six-figure employee and uh, no no college education, uh, whereas architectures, you know, architects are running practices and have team members and have liability and and uh, are working very, very hard and have so much technical expertise, so much creative expertise, it's not uncommon to see them bringing home. It's very common to have small firm owners earning and taking home less than $100,000 uh, mm-hmm. a year, which maybe 10 years ago would have been a decent paycheck. But today with inflation, the cost of everything, $100,000 is solidly a middle-class income, especially if you're a sole provider. If you have a spouse that earns the same thing, well, that puts you into, according to according to the percentiles here in the U.S., that would put you solidly into the middle class, the middle of the middle class, not upper middle class. And certainly if you're in a city, uh, that would definitely be the lower middle class. I was talking to Romero, one of our firm owners, and he was remarking that his income has doubled uh, over the past year. Uh, but he he quipped, he said, now nah, that puts me into the middle class now because he's in a, he's in um uh, San Jose, which is in the, it's in the Silicon San Francisco Valley area. area. You yeah. know, you, you need to be earning about half a million a year to put yourself on the middle class there, you know? So mm-hmm. all these are challenges. And, and, and as, as you mentioned, Ryan, when we compare ourselves, it's easy to, it's easy to look at other people, other, other, um, practices that are low performing or across an industry that's low performing. And, and at least we'll get a good feeling that we may be doing well, but that good feeling can be misleading. Yeah, absolutely. I, I think another problem that we have in the architecture industry is simply we don't celebrate money. We don't celebrate wow. financial success. It's kind of considered uncouth, un- impolite, perhaps. It's you know, it's, it goes against the values of architecture. It's slightly crass. It's grotesque. Um, but I think if I think this is one of the, the biggest misconceptions about successful business. And there's a, there is a gracious and an empowering way for us to be celebrating money because it is the great fuel for agency. If we're talking, we've heard us talk about this many times on the podcast. If, if we're really committed to the things we say that we're committed in making changes for and around, then economic empowerment should be the fundamental thing that we are striving for. And looking for so celebration of so you know, celebrating success, celebrating practices that are kicking ass financially and making good profit and paying their teams really well, and you know, able to take the whole office out on a trip around, you know, to Europe or something like that. You know, how many practices are able to to do that or give everyone healthy bonuses and invest into? new research and design thinking so we're not we're not celebrating money in this, as an industry and this is a this is a gross gross problem indeed and 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 not only do we not celebrate it we actually it's common to denigrate it mm-hmm. there's a culture of of looking down on you know, commercial practices there's blog posts and articles that have been published denigrating practices that are characterized as commercial which is interesting because it's one thing to produce architecture that may not be culturally significant, may not be adding to the discourse and dialogue of architecture, but it, to, 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 to pair that up with financial success, 
uh, is is a fallacy of judgment and a fallacy of values, mm -hmm. and it's detrimental to us as a as an industry. So I was talking with one of our mutual friends. I won't mention his name here on the podcast, but he might even listen to this episode. Uh, he said something very funny uh, in a conversation talking about the difficulty practices have hiring right now. So if you're a practice owner, you've probably experienced that you may have a lot of demand for your services right now and just difficulty finding someone, right? So short-staffed, realizing it's very difficult to find qualified people. And uh, in our internal conversations, this uh, this gentleman said, he said, <laughs> made me chuckle. He said, um, it's not that they, it's not that small architectural practices can't hire it's simply that they can't pay high salaries. I thought, oh, yes. Let's yep. face it. This is a supply and demand is what rules the, the market. And if you as a small practice, if you're paying extremely high wages, uh, you won't have a problem hiring someone. That's for sure. Now, you want to pair that up with a nice culture, et cetera. But if you're trying to get people for pennies on the dollar, or you have constraints on your budget, it goes back to this conversation of money. Mm -hmm. So Ryan, what is, what is the 200 club and why does it matter? So we've set up the problem here, the problem of lack of comparisons. Um, let me, let me backtrack a bit here. So I've been doing jujitsu recently and I've been talking about this on some of my Facebook lives and brought it into the podcast a little bit. It's a fascinating sport. I'm really enjoying it, especially at kind of midlife at my age. It's fun to get out, use my body. But one thing I've noticed is that when I when I first started wrestling, I enjoyed, I was intimidated to wrestle the people that had the higher belts, the black belts, the brown belts, the purple belts, because let's face it, they were so much better than me. And I walked away from that experience just feeling bad about myself generally. I felt deflated. I felt like I'm never going to get this. It's not going to work. I'm not any good. All these deflating feelings. And so it's not fun to experience that. So I went into this phase where I was, I, I wanted to wrestle white belts. And so I would wrestle white belts. But what I noticed about the white belts is that because they don't lack, they lack the technique, a lot of times they use they use really rapid movement, so they're moving really fast. They're trying to use a lot of strength, and it's very easy to get hurt wrestling a white belt because if you imagine their arms are flailing around, it's very easy for them to elbow you in the face or knee you in the chin or the jaw, and it's kind of dangerous. And not only that, but it, was, it wasn't it was as challenging for me because uh, I'm a pretty physically fit guy, so a lot of them I could just overpower them through my sheer strength. And I, I was finding that it was it was hampering my ability to be a good wrestler, a grappler, because I was relying on my strength as opposed to technique. So this is the problem. When we're comparing ourselves with another group or subset of people that are, um, that are beginners or that perhaps aren't high performing, it lowers our own performance. And this is one of the challenges that we have running small architectural practices is that for starters, people generally aren't very open about how they're performing financially. And even when they are, when we look at those numbers, because the industry overall is averse to business, generally speaking, uh, uneducated about business principles, generally speaking, that we have in a business sense, we have low performing firms. We're comparing ourselves against the benchmarks against those. and We're thinking we do great. So I hear people say this all the time. It's like, well, we're already charging the highest in our in our in our market. And I look at that and I say, well, uh, but you're still not posting much of a profit. But see, from their perspective, and I get it, as a firm owner, you think, well, we're actually doing pretty good. We're already hearing clients tell us that we're more expensive. We're already hearing clients tell us that we're a lot. And so we we feel pressure. We don't feel we can raise our fees anymore. So this is one of the challenges of, you know, that you're never an island and you're going to be influenced or impacted by the milieu around you, the other practices that you compete against. And if all those practices are so-called white belts, this is going to be an issue. So to, to take this example a bit further, I was talking with one of our one of our clients right now who's a smart practice member. She's currently in the smart practice program, uh, teaches at a well-known architectural university, also is running an architectural practice, very, very bright woman. Uh, brilliant. Uh, studied undergraduate, studied business undergraduate, uh, studied psychology as well. Has this incredible background. Eventually ended up pursuing architecture because of the desire to, for passion, the desire to be an artist, the desire to create. 
And what she said to me was very interesting. She's like, you know, I, I, I learned business when I was in college and, and school, but what I'm learning in smart practice has completely blown me away. She's like, the business principles that you all are teaching and how you've brought it together so succinctly is absolutely next level. She says, I never could have imagined this. She's all, this blows away any MBA, anything that I could think of. Um, she's like, my, my husband, who also runs a business, is in another program for his business. And I was, he was commenting that he wishes there was something like this available for his practice. So when we talk here on the podcast, the reason I bring this up, when we talk about business, it's difficult at times to understand what that really means. It's kind of this blanket statement. We're the business of architecture. What is business? Well, one of the challenges that I had at the beginning when I was starting my architectural practice first time 15 years ago was I didn't really understand. I didn't even know enough about business to know what it really was, meaning that I thought that business was simply getting the money, getting paid, getting invoices in, collecting, and at a certain level, that's what it is. However, there's so much more than that to actually being a good business person. And so marrying these two together, marrying together the architecture being a divine architect, and at the same time, marrying together business savvy of being a lethal business person. These two are an unstoppable and impressive combination. But how are you going to know that you have that? How are you going to know you have that business acumen? What can you use if you're in the jujitsu realm sparring? It's not like you have belts, right? In the jujitsu, we do have belts. We have belt colors, and so we can see where someone's at. We know how well we perform and certainly if we join a tournament, we're going to know very quickly how well we perform because we're on a live mat. So what's the equivalent in the architecture industry? And this is where we come to the 200 Club. Ryan, Brilliant. tell us about the Brilliant. 200 Club. What is the 200 Club? So the, the 200 Club is reserved for the high-performing businesses. And what the 200 is referring to is a performance ratio okay so this is a this is a financial metric that is basically giving you a benchmark or an idea of how well your business is doing so when we have all of our um, new clients come into business of architecture and the smart practice program one of the first things we get them to do is to run an audit of their company and one of the first numbers that we're all interested in looking at and ascertaining is what is their performance ratio okay and it's quite simply it is the net operating revenue for an for a year or in most most cases we do it we do it month by month so we'll take the net rate net the net operating revenue for a month and then we'll divide it by the amount of full time equivalent employees and then we'll multiply it by 12 to give an average for that month if you had a year based on that month okay but you could do it using a whole year's worth of here's what my net operating revenue was for the whole year and here was the number of full time equivalent employees now What's interesting here is that we're is that is that for many people they'll do this calculation, and it's not just um, billable staff that we're looking at here. We're looking at all staff, all team members, um, and this number is very useful because it gives us. It doesn't tell the whole story of a business. It doesn't it certainly doesn't tell the whole story, but it certainly gives us a first glimpse of how well a business is doing. And for those businesses, we've kind of created a, a set of tiers of where we where we see high performance businesses versus the low performance businesses. So I'll give you the I'll give you the 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 tier the tiers. A a business that's doing a hundred thousand dollars per per full time uh, equivalent employee per year. Um, gets us gets a sad face put it that way this is a cause this is a cause for concern this is means that there are things missing in the business usually there's no pipeline there's no sales there's no marketing um and the team are working their asses off now Tired, one of the things exhausted, that's worth overwhelmed so, so one thing that's interesting here as well is that we ask for full-time equivalent employees which means it's not just bums on seats, it's how many hours. So we count 
one person as being a 40 hour week. So this becomes interesting because if you've got partners who are doing 80 hour weeks, you're not one person now. You're counted as two. Mm -hmm. Now, this changes people's metrics when we start when we start getting into looking at how many uh, there's when there's good timekeeping and we can pull that data very easily and we can work out what the full time equivalent employees are. We start to realize that the huge amount of hours that many practices are doing means that actually their full time equivalent employee number suddenly shoots up and their performance ratio drops great because that means now we're getting a bit more of an accurate reflection it's not just based on the the bums on the seats so the, the markers the hundred um below 100k that's a sad face it's not very good there's a lot of space for improvement perhaps if you're a one-man band and you've just started up your business or you're in a startup phase then we'd expect to see that okay but if you've been going for a while then there's there's a lot then i would say there's a there's quite a, a bit missing the next number would be from the next band, if you like, would be from 100 to 150K. So that's a kind of tolerable. It's okay. Okay, there's, but there's still a lot of growth. 150 to 199, if you like. That is good. Here we're doing, we're doing well. But the 200 club, that's $200,000 per full-time equivalent employee. That is what we consider a high performance business. When we see businesses doing that, usually they're doing a lot right. They've got good pipeline. They're relatively, don't necessarily have to be relatively you know, well established in terms of they've been around for years and years and years, but often that's the, the case. Usually they're able to command higher fees and it's also demonstrating that their team members are not working crazy hours um, and they're working very efficiently. So the 200 club is businesses who are hitting that benchmark of $200,000 per full-time equivalent employee. Now, it doesn't stop there, okay? Because we've got clients who are in the 400s. I think the, probably the highest we've seen in recent times is about 400, 450,000 or so. Uh, dollars per full time and that's a very that's a business that is absolutely kicking ass and crushing it and they're doing fabulous work um and it's it's quite interesting when you run these sorts of numbers on some of the bigger practices so sometimes you might look and look at some of the uh, newspaper articles in the architectural press and they publish um, the size of a firm and like how much revenue that they're generating. You can start to play around and see which practices are high performing. So I've done this in the UK and a practice like Zaha Hadid tends to be, they're kicking ass when I've, when I've looked at it and it makes sense. And they've got some, they've got some good things. And then there are other practices who are, won't mention who they're big. Oh, why not? <laughs> I think BDP. I'll give it. Say BDP was one of the ones I looked at. I have to. I have to recheck my numbers. But there was a. There was a few who were in the in the um, uh, sort of top ten in the UK, and they, they who weren't performing as well as you'd expect mm -hmm. them to be performing. But you can go and check and go and check those numbers. I re I retract the BDP if I'm incorrect. So if, yeah, and if you're listening to this, so just to clarify, uh, the net operating revenue, one way to think about this number, if you're wondering probably, okay, how do I measure up here and how does this rely? I'm curious now. So your net operating revenue, without going into a lot of details, you can think about it this way. It's the money that you have to run your practice after you've paid, not your expenses, but after you've paid any money that's not yours. So what we typically mean by that is money that you've collected for a consultant as a pass-through expense, money that, you're, um, that you've been paid for reimbursables. Like this is money that is just sort of pass-through income. It's not necessarily yours, right? Uh, if you're collecting on behalf of a consultant like a structural engineer, those funds would then get passed through to the structural engineer. So that number is not included because if it were, it would throw off the number, right? Let's say that you're a practice and you work with a lot of structural engineers and the work you do is very structural engineering heavy. And so they, your fees are very, very high, but the actual money that you actually have to run your practice is very, very low. That would be a misleading number. So that's why we use net operating revenue. So if you take your, it's basically you take your total billings for the year 
And whether you do accrual or cash, it's we don't want to get into that now, but they would be a little bit different depending on how you collect, et cetera. But let's just take your cash on a cash basis, the money you collected for a year. This would be most pertinent uh, for, for actual performance because it factors in collections. So the money you collected for a year, and then you subtract from that any reimbursable expenses or any consultant pass-through expenses. And most likely, unless you're buying furniture and stuff like that, that is going to be your net operating revenue. And your net operating revenue then, again, like I said, is the amount of money you have to run the practice, to pay yourself, to pay your staff, to pay your profit, to pay all your operating expenses, to invest in marketing. It's the money that you have to run the practice and make a profit. So that would typically be the money that the business brings in that's earmarked for the business itself. And then, as Ryan mentioned, you just divide that number by the number of full-time equivalent employees, which is based on a 40-hour 40, uh, 40 work week to get yourself the number. Absolutely. I mean, I think it's interesting as well, you said there about the difference between cash and accrual. I mean, with our clients, we encourage them, well, we don't encourage them, we tell them to do cash, because we're, we're interested in collections as well. And we see, you know, the accrual can distort things a little bit. Um, and when we see, you know, uh, it, we find it quite useful when we do it in cash, because it quickly helps us identify it. there's a problem with AR and past due invoices when we start mm -hmm. seeing numbers mm -hmm. that are that are low yeah and we don't want to confuse anyone to get into that too much but ideally you have uh you know we we like to we like to see there's benefits from running a three book system so this might make your head explode but actually running a cash basis accounting running accrual basis accounting as well as running a specific accounting for taxes is really the proper business way to do it because what ends up happening is if you're just pulling all of your performance ratios off of QuickBooks, which is generally the way that your accountant will do things is they'll do it based upon tax advantageous categorization and the way things are structured is all about paying taxes. Now, the challenge with that is that paying taxes and the way the government sees things is very different than the way that you want to see things as a business owner. So for instance, let's say that you have car leases, a lot of in-kind compensation that you take out for yourself that you pass through the business. Like for instance, you take the team out for meals or maybe your wife or your husband is on the, the board of the company and you go out on date night and you have a small meeting and then you write off that entire meal. Well, you know, typically we would want to, in a performance-based situation, we would say, you know, that wouldn't, we just included that expense really because, I mean, under the law, it's because we have a company meeting. But realistically, we might want to exclude that because we understand that that's um, in-kind compensation that's given to the owner. So it can get nitty-gritty, but if we just focus out from a high level, keep it simple. That's why we like this performance. The 200 Club is so beautiful because it doesn't take any of that account. It just takes two numbers, net operating revenue, the full-time equivalent employees, and then it gives you a good benchmark now where you sit. Now, what's interesting, what we find is that when we take firm, firm owners through this process – there's, there's pushback and there's resistance because when they suddenly you see that you're not doing as well as you thought or you find that the tide has gone out and suddenly you can see who's not wearing any board shorts, uh, suddenly that can get very uncomfortable. And so typically, sometimes what we see is firm owners are wanting to justify why their number's low. They'll say, well, you know, we're in a small rural area or, and there's probably 10 or a dozen different excuses as to why we might justify a low number in our mind. You know, we like working with clients that have limited budgets. Uh, we enjoy doing this kind of nonprofit work. And so we, it's very interesting how psychologically we start to provide a justification for our own underperformance and we normalize it. We normalize our own underperformance through justification. And the ramifications of this are serious because we have low industry wages, which causes us to lose brain power. We have you know, we have people who are fleeing the industry, meaning that mid-career professionals are leaving architecture because they're finding better opportunities in other industries. So at the end of the day, you know, we, we have ourselves to blame, as we've said many times on this podcast. But the beautiful part about this is if we have ourselves to blame, we also can be the solution in terms of this problem. But it doesn't help if we don't understand where we're at and where we stand in terms of the 200 Club. Yeah. Now the two hundred club is quite I, I, an honor. Well, no, absolutely. I mean, this is a it's a you know it's a it's a real accomplishment to hit that two hundred and sustain it. Mm -hmm. You know, to kind of mm -hmm. constantly year in year out be sustaining that 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 two hundred. I think it's really 
you know, it's very good. And it's such a useful metric to to kind of impose on yourself, if you like, because it helps you start to calibrate efficiency inside of the inside of the business. And I think it I mean, we've seen it a lot with with companies who are hitting that 200 and they're they're, you know, they're they're very keen to protect it. And they're keen for it not to drop or they're keen to to increase it to 300, for example. And this is where we start to see innovation happening and people getting really interested in how to monitor profitability inside of their projects. And they start getting more interested and more detailed and more focused in, you know, refining their tools for tracking how many hours are being done in a project versus how many you know how much money is being lost so they can see the burn rate on all of their projects and they start getting interested in the leadership and interested in in implementing new technology and tools and ai and innovation all this kind of stuff because they're kind of focused on this performance metric and they want to protect it whereas if you're not looking at that then what we'll often see is the old school way of running an architect's practice of just throw loads of bodies at a problem and with little innovation, with little care for for it, and then just be resigned to the fact that, oh, well, architecture is a low-paid profession, you know, suck it up. Absolutely. So the 200 club, I mean, this, this is, this is groundbreaking because if the architectural industry of practices, particularly small practices, because the small practices make up the vast majority of practices If practices can come, if we have all the firm owners focusing on this number and understanding what it needs to get themselves into high performance mode, who wouldn't want to. Now, one of the challenges that we often tell ourselves is, oh, high performance means more work. Ryan, would you say that our firm owners that are earning three hundred to four hundred thousand dollars per employee, would you say they're more overwhelmed and stressed out than the people earning one no. or less? In general, way less. Yes. Way less stressed. Way, yes. way, way less stressed. Yeah. I mean, the, the I mean, when I think about the the guys who are in the three hundreds, they have the nicest. You know. They've got Everything. time to sit and design. They've got time for their team members. The team members aren't working crazy hours, you know, because that, because that number is reflecting that if you're doing it properly. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, yeah. All right. So what we'd like to ask you, if, if you're listening to this episode, we'd love to know if you have done the numbers. If you're a, if you're in the 200 club, we'd like to know. Uh, send us an email. Just write into support at businessofarchitecture.com. Uh, you can reach out to either of us on any of our social media profiles. You can find me on Instagram at, at business of arc. So business of A-R-C-H. And then Ryan runs the BOA account and the Instagram handle over there is Ryan. It's at business of architecture UK. That's what I thought. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. Or you can hit up Ryan Willard on his personal account. All right. So that's how you can reach out to us. But we'd love to talk to you. If you, if you fit into this category, uh, we'd love to have you here on the show. We'd love you to talk about it. We need more, more firm owners who are willing to, you know, kind of out themselves for being high performing. Let's take away the stigma of making lots of money in architecture. Let's celebrate it. Let's celebrate you as someone who can manage teams, someone that can manage people, hold you up as a light for other practitioners. And the goal here is that other practices, as, as practices begin to, as we stop denigrating earning money and we start to enshrine it and ennoble it, would it be possible to shift the conversation in architecture? Would it be possible to push back some of the forces that are causing the brain drain happening in the industry, that are causing us to such difficulty hiring, that are causing the erosion of the responsibility of the architect, that are causing, you know, on a very personal level, architectural practice owners to sacrifice their health, their wellness, their relationships, their financial well-being, uh, because they want to do work that they love. That's the goal. So please reach out to us if you if you are in that in that number. If you're in the hundred, or even the hundred to hundred forty range, uh, please reach out to us as well. We'd love to talk to you and have a conversation about how the simple strategies that we teach in Smart Practice can help you in your practice. Uh, there's really there's no excuse for being below that range other than simply ignorance. And ignorance is a great excuse because we were never taught these principles in architecture. It's not something that the architectural schools focus on. It's not something that, uh, that we were taught by our mentors. And so uh, that's a beautiful opportunity because what it shows us is 
there's there's some low hanging fruit, and it's 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 not as hard as you think to be able to turn these numbers around. And then once you do, you'll find that you're working less, you're having more time to spend on the things you enjoy, uh, you're being able to do better work with better clients, and we find that people's lives are improved, their their relationships hey. improve, they have more time with their friends, their family, they're more present and overall more fulfilled. So I, w- I will say a little bit about location because this, obviously this is a number that we've kind of, um, you know, in our experience of working with hundreds of practices, um, this is the kind of benchmark where we see it's a very, where we're seeing high performance. It doesn't work if you're in an, in an emerging economy. I would mm, I would say that because the numbers are going to be very, if you're in an emerging economy, South Africa or India or somewhere, the, the numbers are going to be very different. And certainly. if you're listening and, and you're kind of, and you want to have a, a benchmark as well, another kind of rule of thumb that you can use is to take the average salary of say like a five-year experienced architect and multiply it by three. And that kind of starts to give you a good number as well because that's kind of riffing off the, riffing off the, the rule of thirds. And I know that there are other, the number that we're using here, we're looking at all staff. So not just billable staff, we're looking at all staff. There are other riffs of this kind of performance ratio where you're just looking at perform, where you're just looking at billable staff, but what we're looking at here is everybody. Yeah, that would be we want to take into administrator. A, we, we, uh-huh. If you're outsourcing yeah, we want to take into your account drawings, you want to take that into account. Yeah, yeah, that's how that works. Beautiful. Yeah. All right. Ryan, so we will, we would love to see you at our next live conference, uh, the Business of Architecture conference that that we hold yearly. And as part of this, there will be we'll be giving out awards, and we'll start recognizing the practices that are achieving this level of performance because they deserve to be enshrined. They they deserve to be highlighted for making a positive impact in their practices. Because when you when you're earning more money for your services, when you're claiming more of the value that you offer the marketplace, you can pay your teams better. You can pay yourself better. You can start to invest in experiences. You can start to buy back your time. You can get out of the rat race. And the beautiful thing is it is absolutely possible. Fantastic. Yeah, I'm excited to hear from more practices who are hitting the 200. I'd love to hear from a 500 practice. If anyone, anyone out there, instant podcast on you. Indeed, right. Another thing, just going back to this idea of location. So certainly, uh, certainly, location will have an impact on this number. We find, without a doubt, if you're in a rural location, it's going to be more challenging to hit the 200 club. Not impossible, but here's the thing: if you're if you're in a very wealthy area, so if you're in um, a zip code in the U.S. that has a high concentration of wealthy people, if you're focused on residential architecture, it's going to have a big impact. Uh, oftentimes, also if you're in, by industry, so if you're in healthcare, some of these other industries can be more lucrative. For instance, restaurants would be tougher. Um, you know, doing grocery stores would be even tougher than that. Uh, um, manufacturing facilities, labs, would be easier to hit that number. And so it does vary by particular focus. It does vary by um, by location. But here's the thing. It's easy when we think about this. It's easy. This is easy for us to then justify why our number isn't high. So we can say, oh, well, I'm I'm at 120, but I'm in Timbuktu. So, you know, I guess that's just because I'm where I'm at. Well, that's a defeatist attitude. That's resignation. That's like saying, well, you know, I'm better than the white belts in my dojo, but, you know, they're not very good. But, you know, that's c'est la vie. It's just the way it is. Right. That's if you haven't noticed, that's not the way that we that's not the culture of business of architecture. That's not what we aspire to talk about here on the podcast. That's not the, not the way we aspire to be, uh, because the truth is you can hit these numbers no matter where you are. Uh, we live in a virtual world now. You can pick up clients from all around the world. And it's up to you how you want to set the constraints of how you compare yourself to others. But there's power in comparing yourself to a standard that helps you stretch yourself more. That helps you stretch yourself to a bigger version of what you can be, a bigger version of what your company can be, a bigger version of who your teams can be, a bigger version of what your projects can do. And this is part of the beautiful impact that you can have as an architect. But it starts and ends with being a great financial steward of the money and honing your skill as a businessman or businesswoman. 
Yeah, ab- absolutely. You know, create the possibility of of being the being part of the two hundred club. And we've seen practices in emerging economies who have, you know, have started to innovate and do exactly what you're saying, Enoch, and, and working with, um, you know, clients in our other countries where they can get a much higher uh, kind of rate, you know, and sell their services in different places. Again, this is this is why the 200 is so good because it creates innovation. Mm. Mm. It creates innovation, not resignation. I love that. Innovation, not resignation. <laughs> All right. Well, Architect Nation, thank you for listening today. It's been great having you on the show as Ryan and I talk about the 200 Club. And we would like to add your name to the list. So whether you're a current firm owner or whether you're a firm or some someone who's planning on opening their firm in the future, set your target on that. You know, make the 200 list. Do yourself the favor, yourself, your family, your teams. It is possible, and we'd love to see you on the list. And that's a wrap. Oh, yeah, one more thing. If you haven't already, head on over to iTunes and leave a review. We'd love to read your name out here on the show. And now a message from our sponsor, RCAT. There's no doubt that building information modeling has changed the industry. And I'd like to tell you about a cool resource for you as you're looking to get the best product information for your projects. This is what RCAT delivers. RCAT is an online catalog that offers data-rich objects, families, systems for free without registration. And to sweeten the deal, you can download these files in the last four editions of Revit in SketchUp format or DWG format. It's all very clean. They're kept up to date. A fantastic resource for you as you're trying to figure out what you want to specify and making sure you have the best and up-to-date product information. Go to rcat.com today and uh, check it out. That's A-R-C-A-T dot C-O-M. The views expressed on the show by my guests do not represent those of the host, and I make no representation, promise, guarantee, pledge, warranty, contract, bond, or commitment, except to help you conquer the world. Carpe diem.